Good afternoon everyone, let me just check my sounds going in, I'm fairly sure it is. Someone just insulted me horribly by saying, James, you look like you're in prison clothing, which is very, very insulting. Let me introduce you to Marta over here. Marta, Hello. Let, let me tell you, it's much worse than that. I bought these clothes from Marks and Spencers, that's the age I've got to. Um, my name's James, good to see you. I hope you're all well. Thank you so much for joining us, we really do genuinely appreciate it. We've got a really ram session here, we're going through the AMP for OCR A-level, covering the advanced exam information in its totality, so we're going to give it a right good go. We will definitely be finished at the absolute latest today by half past five and we hope to have a really strong ending unlike the Man City game last night. Bum bum. It's a bit disappointing. I was actually rooting for them last night. Anyway, there you go. A um, couple of things I'd like you to be aware of. First of all, kind of your checklist for today. In an ideal scenario, you'll have in front of you your notes pages, you'll have your practice questions and you'll also have in front of you um, your model answers and mark schemes. That's the perfect scenario if you're able to achieve it. If you've got some of that digitally, that's absolutely fine but you will need to be making notes within this session we're going to go through a lot of areas where you need to be scribbling adding detail we're giving you lots of imagery that gives you a good basis but you need to be doing that um, secondly um, what you guys can do to help what you folks can do to help us we don't want anything from you monetarily speaking that's it's absolutely right that this is free. You guys have been through an unbelievable couple of years and we want to support you. But students, teachers, if you would like to support us in putting these things on, a simple subscribe to the YouTube channel and smash the hell out of that like button on the YouTube video. That would be really, really valuable for us. It seems like a small thing, but actually it's really significant. We've got a little dream of 7,500 subscribers for the end of today. I think we're on about 7,260 or something. See if you can make it happen for us. Um, also, if you want to post a comment to me, I will answer your comments live in the session because we're going to go into the teacher, we're gonna have a little break in the middle and then we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. So two little Q&A sections, if you'd like your question answered, you can contact us on the on the hub page, which most of you are watching from, and there's a live chat on there and it comes straight through to Marty, who's gonna then bring the questions to me, assuming those questions are relevant, okay? So uh, get in touch that way and it's um, a great opportunity to get answer something you really want answered. Uh, finally, make sure you realize that everything that I go through in this session, every word, every detail, explanation, description, evaluation, discussion, it is relevant to that AI. So make sure you get it down on that page. Of course, there's other material that's gonna be examined this summer in paper one, of course there is, other than the AI, but it's right for us to focus on that in this particular session. Marta, have I missed anything? I don't think so, no. So, Okay, so let me take my... I just, sorry, we just, yeah, straight, just um, reiterate, please don't be shy, do send questions if you're sitting there wondering what is this, what is that, do let us know. We, we take it as a sign of reassurance that you guys <laughs> communicate with us, alright? So uh, in some ways the worst thing can happen is that nobody asks a question, so we hope that you do. Come on, come to us and ask a beautiful A-level P question on aspect physiology. Okay, with that all agreed, and by the way, I am expecting the first half of this session to be a bit longer than the second half because we're sort of front-loading, got a 20 marker in there, we're doing a lot of movement analysis we've got a lot of sort of cv stuff so it'll probably be the first half a bit longer than the second half short okay but we will definitely finish on time not least because i've got an aqa session straight after this okay good 
let me do the tentative bit of switching feeds and hopefully this is going to work. Okay, we are in and ready to go. I'm going to start the sort of the movement analysis, the joints, movement and muscles part, and obviously the reference to the lower body. I'm going to start this by looking at specific examples of questions and going through it that way. I think that's the neatest way in a revision session to, oops, to do that. That wasn't a good start. Um, so we're going to start here. These performers are completely still in the ready position. So we've, got, so we've got two speed skaters on the start line before a speed skating race. Complete the table to analyze this position at the ankle. So of course, we're looking specifically at the ankle joint. There'll be no credit, credit here for anything else. And in this case, ensure your responses are linked to the correct letter because we've got a little process here. So what have we got? We've got an ankle joint. So we need to be thinking about the articulating bones here, okay? So of course, we've got um, we've got our tibia, we've got our fibula, and we've got our talus, okay? So we've got our articulating bones in there. The type of movement here, now we can see that we've got a sort of a reduced angle, angle here at the ankle. So of course, this is gonna be dorsiflexion which by the way is all one word, dorsiflexion. You can write these straight into those gaps. Um, we wanna be thinking about what the agonist is. Now technically, there's actually two, funny enough, there's actually two agonists here because it's an isometric contraction. In fact, let's put isometric over here. We know it's an isometric contraction because it tells us they're completely still. So we know that's gotta be isometric. So technically the agonist is both the tibialis anterior and the gastrocnemius because they're actually providing an equal force in reality, an equal torque onto the joint. But, of course, when we're talking about um, dorsiflexion, we are typically looking for a tibialis anterior. Now, they are, obviously, that would not be the case if, for example, this was a landing action and this was contracting eccentrically. But the tibialis an um, anterior, this muscle on the front of the tibia, uh, anterior tibialis, is, of course, here, the agnus. So, good example. Not easy, but there. This one definitely isn't easy. Complete the table to ensure, uh, so complete the table to analyze the lunge action at the hip. So we're looking at hip action, and we're here. Ensure your responses are correctly linked to the relevant letter in your answer. So this is a really challenging one because, in essence, this person is on their way downwards. They're on the way downwards. So we know that this is going to be sort of like an eccentric type contraction. So because they're on the way down, because they're breaking, and when I say breaking, I mean like this breaking to slow their descent down. We can start with these two types of contractions. We know that both of these are gonna be isotonic, eccentric. Why? Because the muscle is having to lengthen under tension. So let's actually start at the end there. These are both gonna be isotonic, eccentric. Now, we now can almost go work backwards here. What is our joint movement of the left front leg? So we've got, it's extended at the back, so of course this has to be flexed, it's in a, or it's in a flex, it's going through flexion. Now remember, flexed is when a hip moves in front, extension is when a hip moves behind the line of the body, so that's nice and straightforward. Now this is where it's probably the most challenging in this question, which is the agonist. Now because we are breaking, because we are eccentric, we're looking for the controlling muscle here. So you see for the back, leg, the iliopsoas, which is actually a hip flexor, is actually controlling the downwards movement. It's the agonist because it's con it's contracting eccentrically. Whereas on the front leg, of course, what we're going to find here is it's the glute uh, gluteus maximus. Let me put that in here. The gluteus maximus that on the way down is controlling this leg. Now, it feels a bit strange to say that, but we can't kind of see it in the picture here, but this, this sort of butt cheek on the other side of this person, the gluteus maximus, is controlling this leg here in the downward action. Of course, if we were on the way up, it's, uh, um, it, well, actually, it would be the gluteus maximus because that leg would be now moving backwards. So, of course, it would be it would be extending and concentrically contracting. But we have this controlling breaking action of the gluteus maximus, hence our response in there. Let's do another one. Complete the table to analyze the long jump takeoff action at the ankle. So specifically the takeoff, it's not the landing or the flight. So this is what we're interested in. We've got a bit of this already. We've got joint type. Remind yourself that the ankle is a hinge. This is something that people struggle with a little bit. The joint movement here, because we've effectively got, you know, we've got the gastric nemus here, which is pulling on the calcaneus via the Achilles tendon, it's pulling in that direction like this. Mm -hmm. Of course, what that's doing is it's pointing the toes downwards, it's pointing the toes downwards. So that by definition is plantar flexion. So make sure that we can uh, define that, that sort of uh, movement. So I've already mentioned what the agonist is. We've got our gastrocnemius. You can also say uh, soleus in here. So let me put gastrocnemius 
and I'll put Ancelaus, either of those would get you the mark. And our plane of movement, so any time that we get um, any time that we get movement, which is a form of flexion or extension, in this case we've got plantar flexion, that is always along the sagittal plane. Now, of course, even though I'm not going through this, the explicit teaching of planes of every single joint, of every single agonist, of every single antagonist, you can start to see here now the importance, just move, uh, let me just do, that's okay, I've just realized I've just got a little white, oh no, it's okay. Um, <laughs> distracting myself who thought I had something wrong on the screen. Anyway, um, even though we're not going through the explicit teaching of every single of the sagittal, the frontal, the transverse plane, th your capacity to apply it here is absolutely critical, okay? So this, this sagittal plane is where this plantar flexion moves along. Now, finally, oh, sorry, it's not finally, we've got uh, two to go. We've got complete the table to analyze the box jump landing action. Notice landing action at the hip and the knee. The performer is still in the downward motion, okay? So they're on their way down. That's absolutely clear. So we should already know pretty much that this is going to be eccentric work, not least because, of course, a plyometric motion like this is defined by being eccentric first, right? Ensure your responses are correctly linked to the relevant letter in your answer. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got the hip. We've got joint type, nice and simple. I'm going to put ball and or B and S. Obviously, you will put ball and socket. For our knee, clearly we have a hinge joint. The joint movement, now on the downward action, if we look at the hip, the, we've got the hips are in front of the body. This is clearly flexion, okay? This is of the hip. And our knees are effectively bent. So of course this too is flexion. So we've got to now be thinking about the agonist. Now typically the hip, hip flexion will be performed by the hip flexors, the iliopsoas, the iliacus and the psoas, the two separate muscles. But here, because it's eccentric, we're in the downward motion, it has to be the gluteus maximus which is controlling that movement. Okay, it has to be the gluteus maximus which is controlling that movement. So, what about the knee joint? We've got flexion. Now, of course, flexion typically is done by the hamstrings. The hamstrings we're referring to, obviously, the bicep femoris semimembranosus and uh, semitendinosus. But here, because we're in the downward action, that movement is actually being controlled by the quadriceps. So, we would put in here, for example, let's go for rectus femoris. Whoops, trying to spell it correctly. Femoris, rectus femoris, which of course is one of our quadriceps. You can, by all means, uh, write all four muscles, the three vastus muscles in addition, vastus medialis, lateralis, and intermedius would all be correct. So we've got here correct answers in that context. Now, our last one, in fact, I'll show you the last one when we come to the train marker. This example here, you should have it in your um, in your model answers. We've got our answers here. This is what we put above. We already know that this is correct. So we can check that against the specific question and have what the mark scheme would have expected for us. Notice that Soleus would be accepted. Absolutely fine. Uh, we've got this one here, exactly the same. I mean, the only thing really to stress on this one is, is that notion that the gluteus maximus is the controlling action in this case for hip flexion, but in a downward eccentric action. So because it's eccentric, the gluteus maximus becomes the agonist as the controlling breaking muscle within that context. Now, this is where I'm gonna just switch to, and I wonder if I've actually set this up correctly, just actually gonna switch to uh, my view here. And I just need to change this so we can see it properly. So we're now gonna look at this 20 mark, and I actually wanna show you the video over here. And this, what this is asking us to do is this video shows a, a volleyball player performing a spike or a smash using your knowledge of the musculoskeletal system and movement patterns, analyze the following. So we've got to analyze the ankle joints during the takeoff for the spike, the knee joints during the landing phase. So these are different phases, of course, and we've got to evaluate the use of plyometric training, which of course is coming from our exercise physiology topic. So first of all, the video, if we just, to, well, just to remind you what we would have to do here, and by the way, I completely acknowledge you're not gonna get a video in your exam because it's a paper-based exam. But what you will get is potentially a from to image. The image starts in phase A and finishes in phase B, right? So it's the equivalent, it's the same skill. So let's have a look at this. We want the ankle at the takeoff. We've kind of looked at that. That's similar to our question that we've looked at. And the knee joint during the landing phase. So let's have a look. So this video is going to play through for us. So let's have a look at the ankle during the takeoff now. We can see that we've got plantar flexion. We should be able to link that to the gastrocnemius. We know that that's a concentric contraction, etc. 
And now we've got to look at the knee joint on the landing. Here is the knee lands. It's going into a flexion position, going into a flexion position. And that flexion is, of course, going to be an eccentric type contraction, which is going to be controlled by the quadriceps on landing. And we can play that through one more time, perhaps. We here have got plantar flexion at the ankle in the takeoff. We here have got flexion at the knee eccentrically on the landing from the spike, okay? So let's see how that we've gone about that. And by the way, someone said to me, are you predicting that there's gonna be a movement analysis 20 marker? Absolutely not predicting that, okay, folks? What I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that it's a possibility. I'm also showing a skill that is absolutely essential to this exam because we know that lower body kind of uh, muscles uh, joints are going to be are going to be assessed so I'm trying to show that so we've I'm going through this analysis this broad as possible analysis the ankle is a hinge look look how kind of methodical this is the ankle is a hinge joint it's tib fib and talus the ankle is moving with plantar flexion it's a concentric contraction of the gastrocnemius this is the prime mover so within one within three uh, sentence within three lines there I've got what is that five pieces of credit there not necessarily five marks it's a level question We've got the antagonist is the tibial, tibialis anterior. So we've got the antagonist, the relaxing muscle. We've got it occurring along the sagittal plane. I've even said it's around the transverse axis, okay, even though that's sort of jumping elsewhere. So we've gone through a, in four lines there, we've gone through a full analysis of that performance, in this case at the ankle. Next, we've got the knee as a hinge joint. It's the tibia and the femur. Of course, we're not mentioning there the fibula, which doesn't articulate. We don't mention the patella, which simply sits above the knee. Here we've got knee flexion upon landing, and this is an eccentric contraction of the rectus femoris. Couldn't mention the vastus muscles, of course. And um, this is the prime mover. The antagonist is the bicep femoris, okay? Knee flexion occurs along the sagittal plane around the transverse axis. So it's very methodical how I'm putting my response in to the answer. I am simply doing a movement analysis. And in essence, decided to sip my tea there. And in essence, I am giving all information about, in this case, the ankle at the takeoff and the knee at the landing. Now, obviously, what I'm going to do from there forward is I'm going to go into the other part of the question, which is the ex-phys part. I'm going to look at plyometrics. And I'll briefly go over this, although we are going to look at plyometrics in the exercise physiology session. But just notice what I do here. I just go straight into answering. Plyometric training involves any movement with an eccentric contraction rapidly followed by a concentric contraction, more of which in the ex-phys session, obviously. Bounding, hurdling, depth jumps as well as medicine work, medicine ball work for the upper body. Plyometrics improves elastic strength. Of course, that's part of our ex -phys course because the muscle is able to increase the elastic recoil and increases the muscle overall contractility by increasing the force of concentric contraction phase. Okay, This causes a volleyball plane. Now we've got the application to too, to be able to jump higher to spike the ball and to hit the, sp the spike with more force. That actually there should be credit. As a result, a spike is much harder to block because, of course, it's going faster. Furthermore, a, player, uh, a player's serve will become more powerful and harder to return. However, plyometric training, now getting a little evaluative, plyometric training is ineffective in improving overall CV fitness, which volleyball players do require, and it is sometimes linked with joint injuries. Overall, plyometrics is an essential, is an essential training method for volleyball players and should be interspersed with other forms of both strength and aerobic training. So finishing off with a nice conclusion there. So we got a 20 marker there. And I think in terms of this particular question, what I'm trying to put in front of you students, and I'll just sort of go back to the canvas here. What I'm trying to put in front of you with this 20 marker here is how concise that can be. And when I say concise, I don't mean short, I mean to the point. I'm getting on with it. I'm saying what the answer is, concise, to the point. I've also got this as knowledge-based. You know, have I left any knowledge about movement analysis of the ankle or the knee in the, in the respective phases out of the answer? No. I think probably I could have gone further with the sort of evaluative part of plyometrics. I could have talked about maybe the possibility of injury. I could have talked about the positives that can be done on a volleyball court, that it doesn't require much equipment, this sort of thing. That would have been more evaluative as well. But the point is I'm getting my knowledge into the answer. I'm applying it to volleyball. Look at the number of applications in that second half. Spike the ball. More force. Spike harder. Um, harder to return the serve etc etc i'm getting that link 
into the performance. And I would also just note, as you notice, that I finished off here with a very, very simple conclusion, which I personally really, really, really value. Now, I'm going to take the briefest of uh, pauses just to, uh, just to pause the microphone here. More than anything, because I've got a sort of a croaky throat and I want to drink a little bit, and I'll be straight back to you with CV system during exercise and recovery. So your AI specifically states you're going to be asked about the CV system during exercise and or recovery, okay? So yeah, we need to make reference to rest, but your questions aren't going to come on rest, or at least the ones with the higher tariff marks aren't going to come on rest. So just remind, cardiac output ultimately is the volume of blood leaving the left ventricle per minute. Stroke volume is the volume of blood leaving the left ventricle per, per, per contraction, and heart rate is effectively the number of times our heart beats per minute. Now, I am going to give you the resting values because they're useful for reference point, but we're going to leave that behind almost straight away. So in terms of rest here, we'd expect a heart rate to be in the region of 70 BPM. We'd expect stroke volume to be in the region of 70 milliliters. I'll put the units in for this first time, which would mean that our cardiac output is going to be in the region of, well, I mean, if we multiply these 4,900 milliliters, but in the region of five liters, okay? So five liters equals 70 mil times 70 beats per minute. That's what we'd expect at rest. Now, where this gets a little bit more interesting, we'll look at this graphically in a second, is we're going to go through this methodically. What about if we looked at sub-max exercise? What about if we looked at something along the lines of um, a training run, going for a jog, part of a warm-up, a pulse raiser? Uh, what would be happening to these values um, in that sort of condition? So I want to first of all say that sort of sub-max heart rate, of course, we're talking about something that's up to 85%. So I know this doesn't give you an exact sort of value, but we could be talking about up to 85% of max heart rate. Okay, so it depends who we are. For you guys, let, let's consider you guys roughly 20. I know that you're probably in the region of 18. That means that your uh, your max heart rate is going to be 200 beats per minute, there or thereabouts, which means that your submax could be up to 170. Okay, so that's going to be your, your, your highest exercising value. But what's really interesting to stress here is that your stroke volume actually goes up. And we're estimating, and I should be clear here, it's in the read, it is very much estimating. We're estimating that you're going to be able to work at sub max uh, values of around about 100 milliliters. Now, it's actually interesting to consider why stroke volume goes up because, of course, our heart follows the all or non law, it contracts fully or not at all. It, this is going up because venous return is great to Stalin's law, means more blood going in, more blood coming out. So that means that for our cardiac output, our sub maximal. Um, our submaximal sort of volumes are going to increase. Now, we're not going to give a specific value here because we don't know what our uh, heart rate is. But of course, if we were to say that we were working at, let's say, 150 beats per minute, let's say that's what we were working at, 150 beats per, uh, per minute, what we can say now is, of course, we're now up to 15 liters. Okay, so our, our submax uh, cardiac output could be three times that which it is at rest. Let's take it a bit further. Let's now have a look at maximal. So we're looking here at some kind of race. We're looking here at an 800 meter race, for example, pushing ourselves as high as possible. What would we be expecting here? Well, we know that for people like you guys, you're going to be in the region of 200 beats per minute. We also know that for stroke volume, it can get as high as 140 mil. Okay, and of course, if we multiply these together, that's going to give us a, a reading of around about 28 liters. So let's let's round it and say in the region of 30 liters at maximum exercise of 30 liters of blood leaving the heart per minute. But can I just stress to you that elite athletes can get as high as 40 liters leaving. So we're talking about our sort of elite uh, cross country skiers uh, and so on. Now I want to finish this off nice and strong. And I want to say, just be ready to talk about these values in recovery, because of course, our title and our section requires that we also understand this in recovery. So when it comes to recovery, what we want to be talking here is rather than sort of values, we want to be much more descriptive here, okay? So let's just go through this. So what we're going to say about heart rate in our recovery phase is it's going to gradually decrease and of course that is even going to be more the case if we do an active cool down so we've also got the idea well i did put that in we've also got that, that idea of a cool down to maintain heart rate okay and that's useful because we may want to keep distributing 
additional blood. So we've got gradually decreasing, notice the term gradually, cool down to maintain heart rate during the recovery. That's what we're talking about here. Now our stroke volume, what we're gonna find here is that this decreases rapidly. And I'll show you this graphically in a second. It decreases rapidly. So it's not just gradually going down. Stroke volume goes down really rapidly unless we do a cool down, unless cool down. Now you should already know why that is. And that is the case because if we are not getting that skeletal muscle pump venous return mechanism, more of which in a second working, this is going to decrease really quickly and go back to sort of typically our, our 70 mil. So of course, what we're gonna find with our um, stroke, uh, our stro uh, cardiac output is it decreases proportionately. Now I know this feels a little bit kind of technical how we're doing this, but these are the terms, more, more relevantly, the intuition that you need to be getting in if you're asked about recovery changes in um, cardiac output, stroke volume, or heart rate. Now this is all fine. What we want to be able to do is to, to understand this graphically. So first things first, we've got a graphical representation of heart rate. Can we please emphasize, or can I please emphasize, this is a sub-maximum performance. I'm going to call this a 20-minute training run. This is a classic example of intimating intimating, um, that's run, <laughs> intimating submaximal. So what do we get here? Let's go through our stages. We clearly have got our rest. Notice our rest, our, our athlete is resting at 80 beats per minute. We've got our AR, which is our anticipatory rise at point B, the release of adrenaline attic on the sinoatrial node. We've got a steep rise in uh, in heart rate, of course, it's not immediate. You guys probably know that this would be described here as an oxygen deficit if we were doing that element of the course. We then get what's called a steady state. We then get a steady state. Notice here that we are at submax levels at 150 beats per minute. Now, defining steady state is an interesting thing to do. It is when steady state is when O2, let me do a different color so you can see it better. I don't know if <laughs> that isn't a different color. When O2 supply equals O2 demand. That's all that means. Unlike this area, for example, which of course we don't have, we get that oxygen deficit, we don't have supply equal in demand. Then we get a steep fall after exercise and we get a leveling off. Now you folks also know that that steep fall in recovering that leveling off, you know those as the fast and slow component of VPOC. Now the other thing I would suggest to you is please, if you get a graph like this or any graph in your question, start noticing 80 beats per minute, put it in your answer as the um, resting heart rate. 150 is the exercising, which of course emphasizes submaximal. You could even, if this had values on it, you could even say how long the recovery period lasted for. So take those values and put those into your answer. Now let's have a little look here at stroke volume. We've got two curves on here. I wanted to show this graphically in case you pick this up. Notice what we've got resting value for both of our performers where? At 70 mil. What did we say before? 70 mil. Notice now that our submax, by the way, green is submax. I should have said that on here. We've got submax is green or sort of aqua, whatever color that is. Notice here that it's going up to our non-maximal levels. We sort of predict around about 100. This has gone up to 120. Maybe this is slightly more intense. Notice that our maximal levels are up to in the region of 140, okay, as we mentioned before. So we've got that maximal level. And of, and of course, what we're finding here, as we said before, is that it's actually quite a steep decrease. I'm not very happy with this curve. This should be a steeper decrease down to resting levels, in my opinion. But we've got those values that we can draw out that we've already talked about. So now the values we had now make sense. Let's look at that in terms of cardiac output. We've got our resting values at five. We're going to be able to pick those out. We've got our sub-max values, which seem to be in the range of about, region of about two, uh, 22. And we've got our max values in the region of about 30, okay? Now, can I just emphasize something to you? In both these graphs here, we've got the notion that exercise ends here, right? And you'll notice that the maximal exercise happens early. Now, this is a normal custom when we do these graphs. You might think, well, this clearly ends here. What we're actually emphasizing by this is that we've had to have a reduction in intensity. 
okay reduction in intensity why because it's anaerobic in its nature right and we've got those fatiguing denaturing byproducts of lactic acid and the components of lactic acid so that graphical representation is really useful for us and can i please emphasize folks if you get graphs with values your values must go in to your answers now i've only put values on the y here of course we could be given specific time measurements as well put those in your answer they are always credit i have to change the canvas and i'll be straight back to you so we're going to immediately turn our attention to the redistribution of cardiac output, effectively vascular shunting, right? And based on what we've just talked about, you should be able to look at this image and go, hang on, there's an issue there. I'll give you three seconds. Three, two, one. The issue, of course, is we're saying maximal exercise at 20 litres. I would either, I would either argue this is submax there or as we've just said we should be probably nearer to 30 it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this but we should just try and be consistent with our numbers if we can now effectively what we're saying is at rest 80 to 85 percent of our five liters of cardiac output proportionately is going to going to go to the other organs the liver the intestine the stomach the brain etc and a smaller proportion in the region of 20 percent is going to go to the muscle of course that's because there's pressure differences in the vessels leading them more of which in a second and when we exercise that proportion changes now we've already seen the value the total changes we know why um or at least we know the values of that at the moment but what we're also saying is that the vast majority of that of that blood 80 percent it could be up to 85 percent of it goes to the muscles now and the remainder goes to let's say the liver and other organs okay so what is the process of that and how is that going on so a couple of things first of all i want to sort of talk about this redistribution during exercise okay and I might do a little bit of drawing for you here, time allowing. So note, we are during exercise. We know, again, we might go to 30 here or submaximal. But what we're saying here is we've got these values already. We've now got our age. How is that happening? Well, first of all, have a look down here. The arterioles, which of course simply means smaller arteries, leading to the working muscles, they are vasodilating. So effectively, the lumen, which was this size, the lumen, of course, it gets bigger lumen of course being the space in the vessel and it opens to this size so any vessel that's leading to a working muscle is going to have greater space within the lumen and that's going to reduce the resistance of blood flow and therefore encourage a greater blood flow the precapillary sphincters which by the way i mean oh, am i going to draw this if we look um, i hate drawing this but i'm going to draw it anyway if we look at a kind of a capillary bed here it kind of works like this and there's capillaries everywhere though like this this is and over and then they come off they branch off on this other side this is not a good drawing by the way but they come off and then we've got this uh, blood vessel on the other side like this okay so what's happening is that this blood is effectively this blood is effectively being pushed through here well what we're finding is that the blood vessels sorry uh, the, the pre capillary sphincters around each of these um, little capillaries what they are doing is they are relaxing and because they're relaxing blood passes all the way over this capillary bed and more blood passes through that's what we mean by those, those pre-capillary sphincters i completely accept that's a rubbish drawing by the way but it was quick you know what, what we're going to do um and those capillary beds they become open and flushed with oxygenated blood so that greater proportion goes there meanwhile what we're finding on the other side to let's say to our liver is that shunt occurs how does that happen well first of all these vessels vessels all close down they constrict these little pre-capillary sphincters here we go they they constrict so where can that blood go only down the central capillary and back round our system so it's not that no blood goes to let's say the liver it's that we get vascular shunt and all these peripheral capillaries don't receive any gets shunted through because the others close off that's what those pre-capillary sphincters do also we get constriction of the uh, arterioles which are the um obviously the smaller arteries leading to those tissues we call that shunting why because there's an increased resistance to blood flow now guys can i urge you to realize and this is one that makes me nervous for you if i'm completely honest this question could come up for you as a recovery from exercise question what happens in recovery we are switching back gradually potentially to our resting levels so this of course looks like rest now we're obviously going to be transitioning from what was above but notice the exact opposite happens below we get this time the shunting through the central capillary of the muscle back to the heart to go to the other organs we get effectively 
constriction or vasoconstriction on this side, not on this side where we effectively get dilation to the other organs. We must recognize in our questions whether it's asking us about exercise or recovery because if that's about recovery we talk about exercise, we are in big trouble. Now, we're interested in venous return during exercise. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on this as well. Now, I should stress that what's in this table is generic. It's general information. I'm not going to go over everything of it because you can effectively read it and it's the categoric information that OCIA level will accept. What I want to do instead, and hopefully I've got this set up correctly, just bear with me, I want to go through each of these. So our general points. Okay, so we're talking about venous return is crucial because it leads to a greater stroke volume. Of course, if we get it higher, that's where our stroke volume is going to go up to 100 at some max, maybe 140 at maximal. This is called Starling's Law. And venous return, of course, is the volume of blood returning uh, to the right atrium. And it's, it's arriving in that low pressure venal or vein state, right? Because it's a long way from the pump of the heart through the circulatory system. So we have five mechanisms to get us there. Now, the first one is nice and simple. Simple. We simply have gravity, which I've depicted by an apple. Not a great drawing, come on, let's be honest. But gravity gets us there, right? The second one is, let me just go back up here, gravity, which we've got, of course, if it comes from above, it's going to it's gonna drop back to the heart. Or if we want to get it from the lower extremities, we can effectively put our legs in the air, right? And do that leg shaking thing that people often do in extra times and what have you. Um, now, this one, this is all about the smooth muscle within veins this time. I just want to remind you, if this was a vein, it actually doesn't look much like a vein, if I'm completely honest. But this red layer of smooth muscle, it can constrict inwards. Okay, now we already know that because we've looked at vasoconstriction, right? But this is what's interesting about this is that in this case in veins, they're capable of pulsing <clears throat> almost like a mini heart, not really because it's got very different characteristics. But the point I'm trying to make here is we've got low pressure blood and the smooth muscle can pulse and just add a little bit of pressure. Now, we've also got our skeletal muscle pump. So here we go. We've got um, effectively, oh, sorry, let me, let me go back to the right order. Here we've got pocket valves. And of course, pocket valves, what they do is as blood moves up through this valve here, okay, that valve will open. But if during diastole, when blood tries to fall back down, that blood will not be able to pass that valve. It allows one way flow of blood up only. So we've got that nicely in the table there, pocket valves prevent black, fo black flow during diastole or relaxation only in veins. And, and this is a really nice point. The further you get away from the heart, the more pocket valves you get. Okay, that's actually an interesting point, isn't it? And it sort of emphasizes it. Now we've also got our respiratory pump, nice and simple. How does this work? Well, basically when you're exercising, cause you're <laughs> breathing faster, would certainly deeper and sometimes faster. And that respiratory pump, when the blood gets back close to the heart, the change in pressure in the thoracic cavity force the blood back. And then finally, my favorite personally, not least because I've done a nice neat little drawing here. We've got our skeletal muscle, pump. So what are we talking about here? Well, what we're talking about here is that effectively veins pass in between skeletal muscles. So when those, if, you, if you're exercising, when those skeletal muscles contra uh, contract, it squeezes the vein and of course increases blood pressure in the vein to push that blood back. So guys, I'm not going to go over every word in that table. Hopefully it gives you the absolute essence of where you're going to be questioned. Now, we want to have a look here at the control of heart rate. Okay, so let me be clear. We are looking here at the control of heart rate. Okay, we've looked at what heart rate is during exercise. We've looked at max, submax recovery, rest even. So a couple of things, first of all, we want to be absolutely clear that our cardiac control center, our CCC is up here in the lower brain, what we would call the medulla oblongata. I'll just put it down here in the medulla oblongata. Now, this part of the brain, let's say, in a very primitive way, let's say that it has connection to this part of the heart, which we're going to refer to as the SA node. Okay, so we've got this connection here, the SA node. Let me remind myself, I've got a below. Of course, we've got the table here. I should have mentioned this already, regulation of heart rate. So a couple of things. This cardiac control center can effectively stimulate um, heart rate or the sign of H node to either beat faster or indeed to beat slower. Of course, we know that if we beat faster, that's called sympathetic control. And if we stimulate to beat slower, that's called parasympathetic. So make sure you can get those terms into your answer. So this is 
increasing heart rate this is to decrease heart rate now this is what i personally find interesting is why or how does the cardiac control center know when this needs to happen and when this shouldn't happen so let's just go through this a little bit just just bit by bit first of all we have got little sense organs here right next to the brain but also in our in our aorta and they are what we would refer to as chemo receptors and these chemo receptors this is the central chemo receptor here it's in the blood and it detects the ph level of the blood so when we are exercising our ph level goes down or we could say blood acidity goes up so what happens here is that these chemoreceptors they would inform the cardiac control center we've got a decrease in ph and then that would lead to sympathetic control of heart rate so it's really important that we can do that and by the way when we do sympathetic this is what we call the accelerator nerve the accelerator nerve Okay, for obvious reasons. Now, similarly, we also have, and again, these are in the auto as well, we also have these little sensors here. These are called baroreceptors, and these are detecting blood pressure. So, of course, during exercise, blood pressure is going to go up because, of course, we've got effectively the heart pumping with more force. Uh, we've got more venous return occurring, things like skeletal muscle pump. So, of course, we're going to get a further stimulation sympathetically of the SA node because of that increased pressure. Now, start to think what would be happening during recovery. This would be the opposite. We'd get an increase in, in pH, a decrease in pressure. Therefore, we'd get that parasympathetic control, right? And finally, at least for what we'd call neural control, we have what we call mechanoreceptors. I'm going to refer to them as proprioceptors. And these are positioned in muscles and tendons, and you can re specifically refer to them as muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, if you like. And they inform the cardiac control center that there's more muscle contraction and increased tension, and therefore the cardiac control center can sympathetically stimulate heart rate to go faster. Now, can I stress to you, we, in essence, have another nerve running here as well which during recovery this by the way is called the vagus nerve that during recovery recovery or slowing down or reducing intensity would parasympathetically stimulate the SA node to decrease heart contraction to slow down heart rate so final couple of points on this proprioceptors chemoreceptors and baroreceptors are all what we refer to as neural control why because in essence they're a negative feedback loop thinking you see biology via the brain right but we have other control mechanisms as well we have what's called hormonal control and hormonal control would be the release of adrenaline I'll go with the E spelling on the end, and that will directly stimulate the SA node to increase heart rate. Now you get, you know what this feels like, because when you get a bit of a shock, you get this hormonal release of adrenaline that shoots your heart rate up, right? But the other one is we've also got what's referred to as intrinsic control. I've made a right mess on this page. Intr intrinsic control, and that is that when the heart itself begins to expand further because we've got more venous return, but also when the when the um, heart begins to get warmer, it can self sense so if the heart is contra is effectively getting stretched more it can either sympathetically typically or parasympathetically i'm going to rephrase that that's absolutely not true what i just said it's what we would refer to as myogenic okay so it can self-regulate it can change uh, the sinometrium node can respond to greater contraction of the heart it can earn greater stretch of the heart and also greater temperature of the heart and it can respond itself by self-stimulating myogenically to increase or decrease heart rate. Can I stress that is not via the parasympathetic and sympathetic system, the nerves that we've talked about before. I got that wrong just a moment ago. It just came out, don't know why. Um, final thing before we move on from here. Can I stress the most important thing on this little image is arrow, arrow. Let's say we had another arrow here for increased muscle tension. You will get no marks for saying during exercise there's a change in pressure, there's a change in pH. You've got to say whether it increases or decreases, whether muscle tension increases or decreases. If you just say, hey, the baroreceptors sense pressure changes. No, 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 no. During exercise, the baroreceptors sense and feed back to the cardiac control center an increase in blood pressure during recovery a decrease in blood pressure that leads to sympathetic or parasympathetic that is your job get it right please <laughs> sorry i didn't mean that to sound so fervent <laughs> i almost gave you a telling off for literally no reason um okay let's look 
Uh, some questions. Venous blood is under low pressure. Explain how venous return mechanisms ensure that sufficient blood arrives at the right atrium during exercise. Where we've got skeletal muscle pump squeezes to increase blood pressure. Lovely. Smooth muscles in the veins of veins constrict to force blood upwards. Pocket valves prevent backflow. Pressure differences in the chest, uh, respiratory pump, force blood back to the heart. Gravity aids blood returning from the superior part of the body. Can I just no get you to notice for the five that I made that, I didn't just say skeletal muscle pump i said it increases blood pressure i didn't just say smooth muscle i said that they vasoconstrict to force blood back i didn't just say uh, pocket valves i said they prevent backflow etc etc we need in our explain how responses to state what the impact of these things is now this is a really simple question but notice it's got a big tariff it's got five marks one of the bigger questions you're probably going to do but it's nice and simple for us to do as well Using your knowledge of the vascular shunt mechanism, explain how blood is redistributed during recovery. Reco ah! Recovery from exercise, sorry. Um, so what have we got here? Blood is shunted away from working muscles back to other organs. Arterioles leading to muscles uh, vasoconstrict. That's to the, obviously to the worked previously muscles, as do precapillary sphincters. Arterioles lead to other organs, vasodilate to decrease resistance. Folks, it's a damn easy question unless you miss that word. I can't emphasize enough. What can I say to you? Please read. How do I get it across to you? Please read the question. Make note, read it. I don't know what to say, but switch your nut on, I think I would say. Switch, switch. You know that big Swede on the top of your neck? Switch it on when you're in that hole. Okay, I don't know how else to put it. It's these the this is where basic errors come from, and we need to get that right. Last question before a tiny little break. Uh, chemoreceptors are one example of neural control of the heart. Identify two others and explain how each helps to regulate after recovery. Recover. I'm trying to stress that point, right? So during recovery, baroreceptors detect a decrease in blood pressure. Can you notice that's where the mark comes from, folks? Whereas proprioceptors, they detect a decrease in muscle tension. Okay, I would get my mark for saying baroreceptors, proprioceptors, well, that's two marks out of four. But if I don't say decrease in this case, I don't get the other two. They are the differentiators in the quality of our answers. Right, I'm going to take a, a pause there. I'm not sure if we're going to finish for half time here or not. It depends on the time someone will tell me. And we're back. We're back. Good. Oof. That was a big session. I promise you the second half won't be as long as that. Okay, second half will be quicker. All right, so we will finish on time. Don't worry about that. Marta, any questions or, or yes. uh, requests? Yes, there is one question. Um, one student is asking, do you need to say isotonic or can you say eccentric on its own? Okay, so you've got two options here. The key bit is you do use the, t the term eccentric. If you say isotonic, eccentric, perfect. If you, if you say eccentric on its own, that's absolutely fine. What you cannot say is isotonic on its own. Isotonic uh, suggests that the, the length of the muscle is changing but does not uh, state in which way is it lengthening or shortening that's where the eccentric and the concentric comes in so you must say that fantastic thank you and a couple of shout outs first to Adam Barnacle who spotted that there was a little error in the questions document I believe it's question two had a had a little error the the image of the question there um, had an error which had been fixed or um, had been um, amended when you did the video so in the, yeah. the, what, the what appears on the video is uh, the correct version it is and is, I, I think you've put me a couple of images on here just to clarify this point for you folks if uh, question two we think can you just confirm it's question two in fact it is there question yes. two folks can you just have a look on the right hand side this is what the mark your mark scheme should say it's your mark scheme which has the error long story short we had an error in a question um actually putting this document together made me notice the error um i then corrected it but but by that point the mark scheme had been printed so that's all it is this is the correct version and what i taught you this way is absolutely correct in essence folks if i just put this one on any downward action, any downward action is always going to be eccentric at the legs because they're, they're slowing the descent of the body towards the ground. Our job here is to really recognise, it's harder at the hip than at the knee. I think if this question had been at the knee, it'd be a lot easier. We'd probably recognise that the front leg would be eccentric of the rectus femoris, back leg eccentric of the... Um, 
bicep femoris for example but anyway um, those just to, just to clarify I'll put that mark scheme this is what your mark scheme should look like I apologize for that little anomaly if you got confused or worried that's why and also can I just say to Adam as well um, well hello first of all Adam how are you it's been a few months and I know you're waiting for our case study which you kindly uh, contributed to I think that's going to be out in the next few days I know it's with Martin now just to be finished off stylistically mm -hmm. so uh, yeah thanks for your patience on that one any other questions? Martha? Yeah, well, not no more questions. But another shout out to uh, Whitburn CEO Academy. I just saw who, that. Um, yeah, they posted a few pictures on on Twitter. <laughs> Everyone working really hard. I'm I'm loving the matching levers. Yes, hoodies. I like that too. Um, I'm I'm less I'm less keen I on like the big the green. I like it. I'm especially yeah, green. I'm especially like a bit of race, green. a bit of British racing green there. Um, <laughs> I also like what appears to be the sombrero on the side of the classroom there. I used to I used to always keep a hat in my classroom, and it was called the sombrero of justice because we used to select things randomly out of it to pick people and stuff like this. I wonder if it's for the same reason. There you go. There you go. But Whitburn, hello. We appreciate you, okay? Thank you. Don't put me on the big screen again, though. <laughs> I don't like that. Um, right, I think we should get into yeah. uh, session two, in part two yeah. because we've got a chunk to do and we want to finish on time. So with that in mind, let's do this. So we're going to increase the pace here a little bit to make sure we get there. Again, reminder... Different intensities of exercise and recovery you must be able to do both. Okay, so a bit a bit of a similar principle that we talked about before: minute ventilation, amount of air going in and out of the lung per minute, tidal volume, amount of air going in and out per breath, breathing frequency, how many breaths per minute. So, guys, just to be clear on this, our resting values for breathing frequency could be about twelve. We tend to find for submax it would be somewhere in the region of over twenty. We tend to find with maximal it could be between seventy to 120 breaths per minute. Think about that. Have you experienced that recently where you're <laughs> working that hard? You know, that's that's actually quite interesting for us uh, to be thinking about. Our tidal volume, of course, is 500 mil at rest, there or thereabouts. What do we tend to find for, uh, uh, sorry, so just, let me put it in here. So we've got 500 mil at rest. We tend to find, obviously at submax, it's hard to be specific, but let's just call it greater than 500 mil at submax. And our maximal, this is by the way, submax, this is max. And at our maximal, it, it, it's hard to be specific on this, but we could be in the region of, I'll, put, I'll keep it in milli, uh, milliliters, it could be in the region of three liters for each tidal volume. So of course, what that means for our minute ventilation is it can get us up if we go to max values we can get up to something in the region can even get up to 180 liters of air per minute okay 180 liters per minute potentially um, if you think about our 120 times 3 liters now that would be really at maximum you wouldn't be able to sustain that our um, submaximal values of course are going to be lower but I'm trying to get across to you that point now can I stress again that we've got to talk about recovery and when we talk about recovery, I want you to be saying to me that we get a gradual reduction, a gradual reduction in breathing frequency. That would actually happen first. Second, we'd have a gradual reduction in breathing depth or uh, tidal volume, gradual reduction. So notice those descriptors. We're not being specific with values. And of course, an active cool down is going to affect these things, okay? So a gradual reduction, gradual reduction. We must be able to give those values as we go through. Now, very quickly, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the muscles involved in um, in breathing. And I just want to remind you, we've got here our diaphragm. Remind yourselves, we're interested in exercise, okay? When we're talking about exercise conditions, of course, this is an inspiratory muscle, breathing in muscle. We are going to say that in submaximal exercise, we get an increased force of contraction. And for maximal, let's just call that SM, and for maximal we get an even greater increased force. So this is the language you need to be using when you're talking about changes to the contractile state of the diaphragm, say, during this condition. What we've got here in terms of uh, B, of course, is we've got our intercostals. Now, you will know both external breathing out and internal intercostals but I want to make the same point is that when we are talking about submaximal our intercostals are uh, external intercostals they increase force and during max exercise an even greater increase in force remind yourself that we have got our sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle here this is let me write it all in 
thyroid, oh, what a word, uh, mastoid, of course, this is an inspiratory muscle. And this becomes active when we're doing higher intensities of exercise. So it becomes active as an inspiratory muscle to further increase the depth of breathing. That's what inspiratory muscles do, the depth of breathing. Then we've got our DNRE, we've got our pectoralis major. I'm just gonna call this the pectorals. That's not a very good color on there. Our pectoralis major, I'm gonna call them pectorals. And of course they are increasing the force of the inspiration in this case. And what we're finding there therefore is we're getting the ribs moving further up and outwards or even further up and outwards during exercise conditions. And then finally folks, of course, we've got here our abdominals, let me put it in correctly, our rectus abdo, I hate this spelling, um, someone check, someone spell check, because I always get it wrong, abdominis, abdominis, I, anyway, spell check me, because every time I write that, I get that wrong, it's one of my problem words for some reason, and the rectus abdominis, what this does is it becomes active to increase the rate of breathing, in other words, it pulls down, it pulls down, during expiration, during breathing out, so that we can breathe faster, we can get back to that inspiration quicker. So can I please stress to you the descriptors when you're talking about mechanics of breathing, the descriptors. You're talking about things such as an increased force during submax. During max, you're talking about an even greater force. You might also be saying, of course, moving the ribs up and out further you could be talking about even greater change in pressure. This is what you need to be doing, okay? So it's not enough to simply say, okay, the diaphragm does this. You've got to say it increases its force during submaximal, even greater force during maximal. It pushes the ribs up and out further or greater change in pressure in the thoracic cavity. This is how you describe this at rest and of course, you'd get the inverse during recovery. Now I need to change canvas there so the super quick uh, stop before uh, we're on to the next one. Okay, so for regulation of breathing, I'm almost gonna sort of leave this one with you. And why? Because it's almost identical to the neural factors that control heart rate, okay? So you'll recognize, for example, this is during the exit, we should say this, this here, let me get my layer sorted. Um, this here is very much during exercise, so an increase in intensity, right? But what we've got here is proprioceptors detecting increased increase pressure. We've got baroreceptors detecting increase in blood. We've got blood chemistry detecting a decrease in pH or an increase in blood acidity. So during exercise, this is what you're going to get. So I just want to reiterate that point that you need to be stating what's happening to blood chemistry, to what's happening to blood pressure, to what's happening to movement during um, exercise during recovery. So it's really important that uh, that you folks can do that. Now, can I also make a, a little technical point? For some reason, I really don't know why, for uh, respiratory control, OCR have decided that movement and blood pressure are controlled neurally and blood chemistry is somehow separate. It isn't, they are all neural factors, um, but I just wanna mention that in case they specifically ask you about this or they specifically ask you about this. If they ask you about neural factors, definitely talk about proprioceptors, definitely talk about baroreceptors. I would also talk about chemoreceptors because how they would justify not including that, I really don't understand. Anyway, that's that point there. Now, let's move things on and we're gonna talk about gaseous exchange. So, we want to begin to be talking about gaseous exchange during exercise. So I'm going to assume that you know that this is through the process of, of diffusion. This is the net movement of gases down the diffusion gradient. I'm going to assume that you know that oxygen moves from high concentration in the alveolus to low concentration in the capillary. It would obviously be different in the muscle. And I'm going to assume that you know that carbon dioxide moves from high concentration in the capillary to low concentration in the alveolus down the diffusion gradient. And that's what's happening at rest. But what we want to be thinking about is exercising conditions and could of course be recovery, but exercising conditions, this is really where I wanna focus. The key language is we get an increased, we get an increased diffusion gradient, okay folks? We get an increased diffu diffusion gradient. What do we mean by this? Well, what we'd mean is that as our red blood cells sort of line up, and, ch and you biologists will know what I'm talking about here, as they line up through this capillary, exactly seven micrometers wide, they're sort of getting bigger because our capillary is apparently getting bigger. But as they line up and pass through this capillary here, of course, the difference between, let's say, and we see it in the, il the illustration over here, we see the difference between the concentration of the little molecular oxygens, the blue ones here, and that which is on the red blood cell is, is really significant, okay? So if we've got, if we've got low oxygen in the capillary and we've got high oxygen 
in the alveolus, which of course would happen if we were exercising, because we effectively we're using more of these oxygens that were on red blood cells. Well, what's going to happen there is we get a greater diffusion gradient and therefore we get a greater rate of diffusion. So it's really important that we can say that. Now, the second point, it's a really simple one, is we get a greater, notice the words increased, greater. We get greater quantities of CO2 into the alveolus. And of course, why? Because it's moving down the concentration gradient. We've now got a a steeper gradient so more co2 is effectively blipping across into the uh, into the alveolus in order to be breathed out we also get great i guess what i'm going to put here we get greater quantities we get greater quantities of molecular of just of oxygen of molecular oxygen that's going into the blood or into the capillary so notice the key word here is greater greater Increase. That's what we need to be saying here. So, of course, we're now going to get greater diffusion of oxygen following the principles of cooperativity. Biologists, of course, follow down the concentration gradient, of course, uh, associated with hemoglobin, of course. And that the key thing is we can say that's greater. Now, what I've just stressed here, this would be under sub-max conditions. If we were to now switch our attention to max conditions, we need to add even even greater quantities of oxygen into blood. Why? Because there's an even gr uh, further increased diffusion gradient. There's even greater qu uh, quantities of CO2 into the alveolus. So the key point I'm trying to get across to you, rather than the basics of gas exchange itself, is you must use this descriptive language. You must use this descriptive language. Folks, that is where your marks are coming from. Okay, and I cannot stress that importantly enough. Okay, so I've given you some language there. Hopefully, we'll emphasize that point. You can I've used the terms yet even greater quantities, greater quantities, yet even higher. Have a look through that and just have a look. Now, during recovery, we need to be saying we get gradual decrease. Oh, sorry, that that's uh, um, yeah. So we're going to get. Um, don't worry about that one. We're going to get a, a decreased diffusion gradient okay during exercise so we must again we must again have the language of increase in this case decreased here we've got net movement of gases down the diffusion gradient we've got a return to resting exchange okay so that return could be gradual we've got we're writing here about carbon dioxide moving we've got decreased CO2, um, we've got CO2 diffusion, and of course we could say the same thing about oxygen diffusion. We've got dif decreased oxygen diffusion. So just make sure that you can stress that in the recovery phase. It's effectively returning to rest. Okay, now this is where things get a little bit spicy. In fact, I'm just going to take the briefest of pauses here. Thank you very much, folks. Just another little tea supping moment there you got to in these situations. So I've put a lot of information on this graph immediately, so I wouldn't normally do this. First of all, you won't be asked to draw this. You might be asked to analyze this. Let's see if we can do that. So our job here is really to analyze. Now, we are talking about dissociation of oxygen. That is our focus, okay? So it's an, in essence, for us, the question is, um, what's the difference between the level of oxygen in the blood in the arteries and the level of oxygen in the blood in the veins at rest and exercise, right? In other words, how much oxygen do we actually get into the muscle as a proportion? So this is what we need to be thinking about. First things first, I want to stress to you that this point here, this point here, is what we'd call the moment that uh, or this is this is where oxygen is diffused um, from the alveolus into into the blood. Okay, so if in essence what we're getting here is now that we've got now almost all of our blood, which is now around about ninety seven percent, which is now um, completely saturated our red blood cells with oxygen. Okay, now what we can do now is say that 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 blood is now going to move around the circulatory system, the systemic circuit is going to be delivered. Uh, to a capillary bed, let's say, of the rectus femoris when we're running. And what's going to happen here is that at this point here, this here, this is now the moment after that blood has, has left that capillary bed, it's left that quadricep. And effectively, what we can say is that between the lung and the thigh, our blood saturation with oxygen has reduced from, what would that be, from 97% down to, let's call that, 
call that 68%, okay? Okay, well, so what we're saying here is that this volume of oxygen has been delivered into the muscle, okay? And that's in resting, resting conditions. So a little neat thing to identify here is that even at rest, the majority, sorry, at rest, the majority of blood in our veins, we call it deoxygenated, but more than half of it is oxygenated. So it's an interesting sort of notion. Now, what we find is that during exercise conditions, we get the curve moving to the right. So let's first of all call this a shift right. And we see that here on the illustration, we move this blue curve. But the key thing is now that this is still our lungs. But because of this change in exercise condition, I'll explain why in a second, we get a shift of the curve to the right, and now the muscle, the rectus femoris, is here. Okay, so now after the capillary bed of the rectus femoris, something like 43, let's call it, percent of hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. So that means that we have delivered a whole additional bunch of oxygen into the muscle that's working. Now the question we therefore need to ask is, well, how does that happen? Well, the first thing is we get an increase in temperature. Now you guys have all studied kinetic theory in physics. You've all know about the sort of the probability nature of diffusion and the sort of the randomness and, and but think about what happens if temperature of molecules go up. They sort of rattle and bounce more. They've got more energy, haven't they? So we get a greater diffusion of those um, gases net net because of course they're they're vibrating more they're sort of randomly moving more so we get that increase in temperature the other thing is we get a decrease in pH now I'm not going to get into the technicalities of the denaturing and the active sites here but the point is if we release lactic acid and co2 into the blood our pH in the blood drops and that causes a shift to the right of the curve in other words folks dum 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 lactic acid not all bad co2 production not all bad why because it causes oxygen to leave hemoglobin more readily they dissociate more readily because it's in a more acidic condition now again you want you may well be studying this in your a-level biology you can even rely on some of your gc biology to sort of have a basic understanding of this we call this process of the shift to the right the bohr shift and that's all it is folks that's an s believe it or not uh, it's the bohr shift, and that's all we're talking about so that's how we would analyze this curve let's go further questions we need to get going here um Estimate the exercise in tidal volume from the graph, and I hope you can see the graph nice and clearly on yours. Estimate the change in tidal volume between rest and exercise conditions. So effectively, we're analysing spirometer. Resting value 500. Exercising tidal volume is 2,000. So this is kind of it looks like it's submax to me. And the change in tidal volume, of course, is the difference. We've got some little mathematical skills to go through in there, nice and simple. Here. At the start of exercise, the diaphragm and external intercostals contract with more force. We agree to increase tidal volume. Explain how this change is controlled. So it's effectively the control of the respiratory muscles. It's done by the respiratory control center. It's done by neural mechanisms such as baroreceptors detect an increase in blood pressure. And the respiratory control center sympathetically stimulates the muscles. Now, I only picked up three. Then notice my other marks were for the respiratory control center in a part of the RCC which controls inspiration depth, okay? So just noting that the RCC has two components to it. It's got the ICC, inspiratory control, and it's got the ECC, the expiratory control. Now, just one point about that, of course, inspiratory control center controls inspiration, breathing in, but it also controls breathing out because it controls the ECC. Now, the other point here is I didn't talk about blood chemistry, which I could have obviously picked up marks for in there as well. So I missed out on one mark as a result of that. Let's go a little bit further. Effectively here, we're looking at energy continuum. Now, I really want to get some critical points across to you here, folks. The energy continuum is the relative contribution of all three energy systems to energy transfer. And to emphasize this point, I simply want to say to you, if you look at that graph, all three energy systems are contributing to energy release or energy transfer at all times. Prove me wrong. Because you could take any point across this x-axis and you could go, right, I'm going to take this point here. Are all three energy systems contributing? Yes. One of them's predominant the lactic acid system but they're all contributing and that's the point i want to get across about energy continuum so get out of this mentality of triathlon is aerobic uh javelin throwing is atp pc all are contributing at all times and that's what the energy continuum means now we obviously want to know which system is predominant and we base that decision on the duration of the exercise and the intensity of the exercise so let's go through this 
we see with our ATP PC system, which of course you're going to study separately, we get that it peaks very early in exercise and it's got a very, notice its peak is much higher in intensity uh, than the others. And notice here that it declines and around about 10 seconds we get a threshold point. This is a threshold where the lactic acid system becomes predominant. Why? Because we've got a longer duration of exercise. Notice that the lactic acid system can't release quite as much of a proportion as the ATP PC. And also it peaks at around about 60 seconds. Here's our peak. But also by 180 seconds we get another threshold and the aerobic system becomes predominant. But again, notice at all points all three systems are contributing. I'd also like to add here that this value and this value are really, really important. 10 seconds and 180 seconds are the point of your two thresholds, but your energy continuum is, is deciding which is the predominant energy system based on the intensity and duration of exercise. Now, I've already provided this for you. It's a little subtle part of our specification, and I want you to make sure. I literally don't know what to put in this row, so teachers, if you're out there and you've got some good ideas, let me know. But I just want you to make sure that you can t get this language right. ATP PC system is very high intensity. Glycolytic is high. Aerobic is moderate. The duration, as we just said, ATP PC up to 10 seconds, up to 120 seconds for glycolytic or lactic acid, around about two hours for the aerobic system. These are really interesting. Recovery periods. PC system, 50% in 30 seconds, 100% in two to three minutes. And we tend to look at a work relief ratio of one to three if we're training the system. Glycolytic takes in the region of five minutes, but it can actually be up to an hour. Uh, and work relief ratio of one to two. In other words, we recover twice as much as we work. Aerobic system, no recovery other than repaying the oxygen de deficit. Look at your recovery lessons created by an aerobic work. Uh, work relief ratio of one to one or less. Some often one to 0 0.5 for aerobic work. Now, fitness levels, I don't really know what to say on this one because, of course, you've got to be fit to perform at elite level in any of these. So I'm a little unsure what to put in there, so I'm going to kind of leave that one blank, but it's there. Um, now then, analyse the energy continuum graph. Okay, so what have we got? ATP P system is predominant at the start and only for about 10 seconds. This contributes dramatically. Uh, this, this contributes dramatically decreases in the glycolytic system becomes predominant. This system remains the primary system up to three minutes. There's our time factor. It peaks at one minute. We looked at that in the curve. The aerobic system becomes predominant after three minutes. All energy systems are contributing at all times. The graph is only relevant for sustained activity with no breaks. That's your nice point, that last one. We only, with the energy, so just this, just be clear, this curve only makes sense if exercise continues, okay? And of course, it needs to be quite intense. Uh, although the intensity will drop as the aerobic system, we'd have to lower intensity, but it's a continuous exercise. Now, exercise at altitude, folks, nice and simple. I'm going to go through this nice and quick. Let me find my right point. We've got here all of the, uh, in essence here, we've got all of the um, the factors that take place, but I just want to sort of say to you what we've got here. It has to be done at 2,400 metres or above. People have to acclimatise. In fact, this is hard. This is a tough experience. We tend to do altitude training sort of a month to a bit more uh, before the event. It's what we call hypoxic, which means there's a lack of oxygen in the air. Here we go, fewer oxygen molecules available in the air. That's hypoxic by its nature. And these, if you like, these are the negatives when we get this. Why we need to acclimatize. We get a reduced arterial uh, um, PO2. So if we were to go back to that, what effectively what that would mean, folks, if we go all the way back up to here, what that would mean, where are you? It would mean that this line here would not be here, it might be here, for example, which means we've got less oxygen in our arterial blood in the arteries, right? We therefore, we get less oxygen to the muscle. We have to have a high heart rate. We have to have a higher breathing rate. We've got less saturated blood, as we just said. We've got a lower diffusion gradient. We get a decreased rate of diffusion. That all happens because we've gone to altitude. And it's this that we really need to sort of focus on when it comes when it comes about. But what would we be expecting in terms of aerobic adapt adaptation? Well, we would have the increase of uh, red blood cells. Okay, we can call that an increased hematocrit. In other words, we get more red blood cells. We get an increase in strength of respiratory muscles, of resp muscles, our diaphragm, our in intercostals, our sternocleidomastoid, etc. We get increased capillarization at the alveolus. We get more mitochondria in the muscle. 
they also get bigger by the way we get more myoglobin in the muscle we get stronger up arrow smooth muscle around the blood vessels so they can vasoconstrict and dilate um, to a greater extent we get cardiac hypertrophy we get as a result of that we get an increase in stroke volume we get a decrease in resting heart rate because we've got a decrease in resting heart rate we get an increase in heart rate range so when we're exercising between rest and maximal we've got a greater capacity to actually shift the heart rate all of those are aerobic adaptations to train now we could go further there's actually quite a few but those will do for us for now okay we've got here describe the short-term effects of exercising at altitude now i should be clear here guys this is when we get there this is not the adaptations at athletes diffuse less oxygen at altitude because there is decrease in partial pressure um, of oxygen in the air this causes an increase in tidal volume and an increase in breathing rate noticing their short-term effect what i would say here is if this had been the training effect or the long-term effect that's our adaptations but i'd also like to say that adaptations are temporary okay they do not last forever so of course we would come back down to altitude one to two days before race or event okay so that's what we're looking at there now i need to change canvas so i'll quickly do that straight back to you we're nearly there <laughs> that's funny i thought i had more to do um i had some waving arms saying to me no 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 you need to come back on the camera sorry folks um i thought we were still going i thought we had another whole canvas to go we haven't so we'll finish there back for a q a hope that's been useful well folks sound yet good how was that hope that was useful marta we've got a couple of minutes questions thoughts yes. shout outs anything that you'd like to a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, will we need to explain how each energy system works, such as creatine kinase breaks down ATP, etc.? Okay, so two answers to that question. You need to learn everything because obviously all we've covered here is the AEI, and there's other things outside of that could, that could be on lower tariff questions, right? So yes is the answer. However, if I just show you something, which is ultimately the reason I didn't cover that in this session. Just like to have a look, this is the AEI, and I'm assuming you're referring to, uh, let me just go on to this, I'm assuming you're referring here to uh, to this here. Why are we not actually covering the breakdown of the systems? Well, the reason that is, is that this section here, if I go to the specification, it's actually from here that I've just taught you. And it, uh, sorry, it's actually from here that I've just taught you. This is not, on that AEI, what you're talking about, which is the type of reaction, the control set enzyme, the site of reaction, so on. So what we've covered here is the continuum, the predominant system, and the interplay of energy systems. And we've covered that here because it's that which is here listed in the AEI. It is not this that is listed in the AI. So I hope that clarifies it, but that that's the reason why. But I would like to, again, just repeat that point and be as specific as I possibly can. Of course, you do need to learn that other stuff because it could be asked uh, of you um, of course so yes you do need to but it, it wasn't listed in the AI which is why I didn't cover it here brilliant that's great um, and no we haven't got any other questions I said we had a couple we, don't, we only have one um, shout out to Dawn's students mm -hmm. um, they put a little photo on uh, I'm just looking at it now Twitter. hello and I'm glad to we're glad to know that some of the PE students are enjoying <laughs> the session. I'd like to know what's happening with the rest. I, I've also just seen there's a young uh, a young person, Kieran Young, sent a message here. Yes. I've just I've just seen that as well. Okay, and I've just seen what we've written back. So yeah, Kieran, apologies if it went a bit fast today. Um, the we're just trying to squeeze a lot in in essence and i think that what the message said there is the key thing you can obviously go back to it on demand uh spend some time with those practical questions those mark schemes um and of course contact us if we can help with anything and we will absolutely do that and the fact it's on demand afterwards hopefully will help you a little bit as well and also any particular areas of course that that kieran's finding particularly complicated they can, can always go back to the videos on the side yeah well that's and, and do, you know, do the whole, the whole well, well it's thing. interesting you mention that because i do feel a bit of a fraud sometimes in, in the revision sense because i teach in a way that's completely different well the, the the rhythm of it is different to how I teach on the canvas is normally when I'm teaching from scratch and sort of building for real understanding as slowly as it takes 
Um, we actually don't use any imagery or things like that. We draw everything and we handwrite everything and these kind of things. So sometimes feel a bit fake. That brings to a really good, great point. I meant to mention this earlier. If you're a teacher out there, folks, and you're not subscribed to this, by the way, this is not a sales thing. Um, just remember, we do a 28-day free trial. So if these A-level kids that you've got around you, or indeed your GCSE kids, or whatever course happens to be, if that would benefit them for the next month, prepping and building, including the use of exam simulator, just get on that free trial. Don't worry about paying as that. You know, you might choose to do that sometime down the road, but you never need to. Okay, so it's there for you if you want to do 28-day free trial. Just, just milk it. Just make the most of it. It's there. Okay. Thank you. And Wendy from. Um, Not Wendy Reynolds. Yes. From no. Field. Yes, she says thank you very much. Wendy, Bye how session. are you? It's been it's been much much too long, Wendy. We we should we really should have a chat or a get together. We're only down the road from one another, and it's been too long, Wendy. You're appreciated by us, as I think you realise, and I really appreciate that comment. Thank you. Right, we've got another session in less than half an hour for mm. AQA. Oh, I do have one more thing to say. Uh, you OCR lot. The notes pages, the mark schemes, the model answers for the experts and the biomechanics, which we're doing next week, will go live, I'm going to say tomorrow, Marta. I think we're pretty much mm -hmm. there, aren't yeah. we? So the experts and the biomechanics will go live tomorrow. Now, those two are, again, whopper sessions, okay? Especially the experts we've got to go through. Ergo aids, uh, strength training, flexibility training, oh, I forget something. Um, injury rehabilitation if I imagine that no I think that is in there and um, on the biomechanics we've got to do the principles the linear and the angular motion okay so there's quite some big chunks but um, they're not as big as this a and section so it should fit a, a little more snugly within, our, within an hour that's the plan anyway okay mm -hmm. so I think we're going to sign out let me make sure that I uh, put this closing screen on there it is uh, thank you so much for your time from our hearts we really appreciate you spending this time with us and we hope it's been useful genuinely so have a lovely afternoon evening take care bye